Greetings everyone, Rob Chastner here, continuing in our study of Matthew verse by verse. And if you're following along, we're in Matthew chapter 26. And you'll notice that this chapter opens with a question from the Jewish uh, religious leaders asking Jesus to show them a sign from heaven. And you remember going back to ver uh, chapter 24, Jesus told his disciples as they were walking out of the temple that there would not be one stone left unturned, referring to the temple building. The disciples concluded that there must be, that must mean that there's going to be the end of the world coming. And so they asked Jesus privately, <coughs> uh, uh, what will be the sign of your second coming? And so in chapters 24 and 25, it's covering uh, Jesus answering that question um, about uh, which is known as the Olivet Discourse. And it's all about the aspects of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And he finished chapter 25 and now he's beginning in chapter 26. It is as if Jesus is saying, oh, OK, guys, uh, that's enough about that. This is that's about the future. Let's uh, let's talk about what's going on right now. And so. Chapters 24 and 25 clearly showing a message to the disciples and for you and me, just be ready for end times. Get your life in order. Live your life today as if it was going to be the last day. Settle scores that you have with your brothers and sisters. And so uh, if, if we would live our lives that way, no matter what the storms of life come your way, we will just be fine. And so now in chapter 26, Jesus begins, um, uh, brings them back uh, to the present time and what's going on. So uh, if you have your Bibles, if not, uh, the scriptures will be in the little box below this video. Press pause, read verses one and two, and then press play once again. <clears throat> All right, so we're about a day and a half prior to the crucifixion. Jesus is going to become uh, the complete fulfillment of the Passover lamb in the Old Testament. And uh, when God wanted to deliver his people from Egypt, they were instructed to take the Passover lamb, sacrifice it unto the Lord. The blood of the, of the sacrifice is to be placed on the doorpost of the house. And then when the angel of death flies over, that angel of death or that destroyer, when he came to, uh, to Egypt, the, the blood which was applied to the, to the doorpost, uh, that angel would pass over them. And it was through the blood of the Passover lamb that Israel received deliverance from Egyptian bondage. And here in these verses, God has an even bigger plan. And it's not just getting the Jews out of the Egyptian bondage, but in addition to that, it is getting mankind out of the bondage of sin. <laughs> and that which we read in, in the book of Exodus, it is simply a snapshot. It's a representation or a typology of a much bigger thing which God had in store for mankind. And so if you remember that when John the baptizer, uh, the very last Old Testament prophet, who had the responsibility of introducing or paving the road for the Messiah's ministry and introducing Israel to the Old Testament Messiah. And that's out of Malachi chapter four, verse five, where he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Uh, well, those words take away, uh, that was the present tense that was it, it was stated. So Jesus took away your sins from yesterday uh, he takes away your sins for today, and he will take away your sins for, uh, uh, that you will commit tomorrow. It is through faith on the applied blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that you and I receive forgiveness. Notice in verse 2 that Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, which is a way of him saying, I am human. Yes, I am God manifested in the flesh, but I am human. And when he became human. I understand that was not a step up, but rather it was a huge step going down. He emptied himself into the form of a servant and humbled himself all the way to the cross. So what, what Christ is saying here, that within the next couple of days, 
uh, you will all see the fullness of my humiliation. They are going to beat me, strip me naked, spit upon me. They're going to nail me to a tree. Uh, uh, you, you know, you, you won't find an image that's more humiliating than that image. And all of this is going to happen to uh, Jesus over the next couple of days from this moment that we're studying. Remember, Jesus lowered himself to be human because God cannot die. And there, the, 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 the sacrifice to pay the propitiation, the prepayment of sin, had to be from shedding blood in death. And so the wages of sin are death. And so you can't, he couldn't die as God, so he reduced himself temporarily into a man. All right. So press pause and read verse 3, and then press uh, play once again. So this is the leadership who is seeking to destroy Christ. They had a little meeting. Notice where the meeting was. The meeting was in a palace of the high priest. What in the world is a high priest uh, doing owning a palace? You know that you're in trouble when the guy who is supposed to be the most spiritually minded among you is living in a mansion or a palace. What is wrong with that picture? If you wanted to be an entrepreneur and make a ton of money, there's nothing wrong with that, but that is not what's going on here. The high priest is making an excess of $3 million a year. He belongs to the family of Anis, and um, that family had a death grip upon the Jewish temple for over six decades. They made 12.5% Right off the top, all the business in the temple, uh, you think about the millions of animals which were sold uh, there for sacrifice and the millions of dollars uh, being donated there. And this family got 12 and percent right off of the top. And so this guy is becoming fabulously wealthy off the backs of all the sincere worshipers at the temple and this palace where Caiaphas lived. Uh, where does, where, does Caiaphas, where does Caiaphas end up? Uh, you do a little research online on the Caiaphas uh, ossuary. Uh, this is a, uh, where the, they found uh, back in, the, uh, uh, in, in November of 1990, they found the box of bones of, of Caiaphas. And so this is where the guy who puts an end to the life of the Messiah, he ends up. He ends up as a pile of bones in a box. So it's good for us to remind ourselves frequently that no matter how many square feet you have in the home where you're living today, there is a box in your future. And that box in your future, uh, you know, uh, uh, you, you can get carried away with income, you can get carried away with toys and possessions, yet at the end of the day, each of us has a box waiting for them. Uh, and so... When that day comes, what is my fate going to be? Josephus, Josephus speaking of the family of Anis, uh, uh, he writes, uh, this crime syndicate, uh, they were street thugs, they were religious, they wore religious robes. He said of them, they were heartless when they sat in judgment. Uh, they had not experienced the mercy of God, and so therefore they had no mercy upon other people. They were great hoarders of money. They would beat up other priests who would not give them their tithes. Uh, then, uh, and these priests who should have been supported by tithes and offerings were being ripped off by the family of Anise. And Josephus tells us that many of them died uh, the, the, the priests for the lack of food. And so these guys are gathered together. They're essentially discussing that this guy from Galilee, Jesus, he is cutting off the prophets. He is chasing away the money changers. He's chasing away those who are selling livestock on behalf of us at the, ter at the temple. We cannot have this. We must do away with this guy. And so they have a meeting in the palace. And now they have a problem. All right, what's the problem? Press pause and read verses four and five. So the problem these guys have is it's it's uh, they're in Jerusalem. It's during uh, one of the festival pilgrimages, uh, the pa festival of Passover. There's over two million pilgrims there. 
wall-to-wall -wall people, Josephus tells us that Caesar wanted a census completed at this time. And so what they did, because of the massive numbers of pilgrims, they counted the number of sheep that were slaughtered, and they would multiply that times 10. So they had 256,000 sheep, and there were 10 people allocated to eat for each sheep. And so there were 2,560,000 people in the census during this time. And for the past three and a half years, Christ has been crossing over the northern regions of Israel. And what has he been doing? He's been feeding the hungry, bringing sight to the blind, healing all who were sick. Uh, everywhere he went, he was doing good. And so for the past three and a half years, the nation of Israel has been experiencing the goodness of God. And so now you've got two and a half million of those people gathered in Jerusalem. How many of those people do you suppose were directly favored by Jesus? You know, people who, 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 who were sick and they were, they were uh, healed, people who couldn't see and they, they, now they can see. You know, and to throw this guy into handcuffs and drag him off into jail, chances are that there'd be a massive riot. And so notice in these verses, they have to take him subtly. Some of your Bibles might say treachery, and that has the meaning of deceit or deception or baiting and trapping. And so they have got a problem. Jesus has a lot of supporters, and we don't need a riot on our hands. What are we going to do? Now, Matthew introduces to us the two very famous people. One is famous for his devotion, and one is famous for his betrayal. First, we look at the one who's devoted. All right, so uh, press pause, read verse 6, and then press play once again. Now, the key word here is that Simon had leprosy obviously he had it no longer is he quarantined so he's healed and you remember jesus never spent the night in jerusalem he was always leaving jerusalem and he'd spend the night outside the city he'd go up through the mount of olives into a small village of bethany this is a very obscure town and isn't it interesting that god the god of the universe has an interesting has an interest in anything obscure at all. He is interested in those things which are overlooked, like the small and obscure community of Bethany. Now, many Bible scholars believe that Simon was the father of Lazarus, uh, Mary, and Martha. If that is true, Jesus has really uh, done a lot of work for this family. The dad well, used to be a leper. The brother was dead, for goodness sakes. And who knows what Jesus did to help the two sisters, Mary and Martha. All right. Uh, press pause, read verse 7, and then play once again. We know that this woman, Mary, the sister of Lazarus, uh, and, and perhaps the daughter of Simon. All right. Read verse 8. Press pause, verse 8, and then come back. Now, this word indignant, it has the meaning that you are so angry that your head hurts. You're so mad that you have a headache. These guys are watching this and their heads are killing them. And so they ask, why this waste? All right, read verses uh, 9 through 13. Press pause, 9 through 13, then press play once again. So here we are some 2,000 years later than this recorded event living in the Western Hemisphere and what are we doing? We're still talking about Mary, uh, what Mary has given to the Lord. The other gospels speak about this alabaster box as being broken. It doesn't mean that she cracked it over his head like an egg. This is not what it means. Back in this culture, an alabaster box was typically a vase or a bottle. When it says that, uh, that it was broken, that meant that the seal of the bottle was broken. And once the seal was broken, the value of the alabaster uh, bottle is greatly diminished. John tells us in John chapter 12, verse 3, Then Mary took a, uh, about a pint of this expensive perfume made of pure nard, made of pure nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. Some of your Bibles might say it was a pint of spike nard, or pure nard, 
this only grows in the Himalayan mountains and it's it puts off a magnificent perfume. John tells us that when she unsealed the bottle that the scent of it filled the entire room and so she takes this uh, and essentially dumps it on the top of Christ's head and if you continue to read in John chapter 12 we find the estimated value of this bottle of nard uh, verse 4 it says in John chapter 12 but one of his disciples Judas Iscariot who was going to betray him asked why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 denarii uh, and the money given to the poor which would have been equivalent to an annual salary of a of a blue collar worker and so literally valued at tens of thousands of dollars and now you could understand why the disciples were indignant yet Christ turns to them and tells them to shut their mouths leave her alone now understand that this was likely the most valuable thing that this woman had owned in her entire life. It would be, uh, it would have been used perhaps in three different ways. If a woman was not married and she had no children, this was a kind of an object that she would use to keep in her retirement years when physically she could no longer work and support herself. This would be sold and sort of ease the burden of the cost of retirements. So another way it was used, if a woman would keep this for her wedding night, and this would be some extravagant way to express her passion for her new husband. Or a woman might keep this for the person she loves the most when that person passes away, and it would be an extravagant way to express her sorrow. But notice what Mary is doing here is that she is expressing her her extravagant worship this is the most precious and costly thing she has she is giving it all to the Lord Jesus Christ and she seems to have a really good understanding even though the Apostles do not of what is about to happen to Jesus and the cross um, notice that her devotion is misunderstood the people around her think that she's crazy and uh, isn't it interesting that we all have friends, we all have family who misunderstand our devotion to Jesus Christ. And yet you could go into Lambeau Field in the middle of the winter uh, with a block of cheese upon your head as a hat and your family would not think that that's weird at all. Yet somehow when you're devoted to Jesus Christ, uh, I'm now the weirdo of the family. Mary was misunderstood here, and whatever devotion that you give to Jesus Christ, you too will likely be misunderstood as well. Notice that it is the disciples who don't understand, and that lets us know uh, that you and I, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we can have one opinion about a situation, and yet God could have a very different opinion about that situation. Uh, the disciples are looking at Mary pouring out this expensive stuff and saying that that's the worst thing in the world. Yet Jesus is saying, this is very cool. Leave her alone. Back off. It's a wonderful thing. And so we must be very careful that we that, that before we pass judgment, that we make sure we have the mind of God or the perspective of God. John tells us that all of this turmoil was started by Judas Iscariot. Now notice as we get into verse 14, the word then. When is then? It is when Judas starts stirring things up. You could just imagine the stare that Jesus must have given to Judas, a look that would kill. And then Ju Jesus calls Judas out in front of all the others. All right, press pause and read verses 14 through 16 and then press play once again. <clears throat> Now, what is Judas selling here? He is selling information. There is a lot of people in Jerusalem who think highly of Jesus. The religious leaders cannot have Jesus arrested when he's surrounded by the multitude of fans. And so there are, they are interested to know how can we get him to arrest him when he's in an isolated situation. Judas comes along and says, I know his routine. Uh, every night he leaves Jerusalem. We go up to the Mount of Olives. There's a few places which he likes to stop. He stops there, tells the apostles to stay for a while, and he goes off and he prays on his own. 
And so when he goes off to pray, I will come and get you. I will lead you under the cover of darkness and he will be completely isolated. Then you can take Jesus with great subtlety. And so here, Judas is selling out Christ, giving them the information to arrest him when he's the most isolated. Now, who is Judas Iscariot? The name Iscariot comes from a Latin word, Sicarius, which means dagger man, or it means traitor. The Sicarii were a group of rebels, a group of assassins who were assisting Rome in the Roman occupation. And uh, the historian uh, Josephus said when Roman governor Albinus reached the city of Jerusalem, he made every effort to ensure peace of the land by exterminating most of the Sicarii. Uh, uh, what appears is that Judas was nothing more than one of these extreme zealots. Um, Judas was not drawn to Jesus by faith, but rather his relationship with Jesus was based solely upon whatever political advantage that Christ might be used for, to gain some sort of sovereignty for the nation of Israel to escape the Roman rule. Understand that Judas was used of God. Do we understand that there were times where that, that Jesus would send Judas and the other 11 disciples out and there were times they would come back rejoicing. Remember they said, hey, we cast out demons. Can you believe that the demons actually listened to us? And remember that there was an occasion where Jesus said, don't rejoice in the fact that you cast out demons, uh, but rather rejoice that your names might be written in the book of life. And you have to wonder if Jesus was not directing that particular comment to Judas himself. And so, here is a man who has experience of being used by God. How does he go from being used by God to become a betrayer of God? If you understand, uh, understand that if you betray any relationship which you have going on in your life, you have a husband, you have a wife, a friend, you have a relationship with your country, with your church, if you sell top, top, uh, top secrets to foreign countries, you don't just wake up one day and say, you know, I think I'm going to go betray my country. But rather, you can look back over a period of time in your history and see the path which has led you to the point which sets you up for this great betrayal. If betrayal is in your life, it's because you have been set up to be a betrayer over a certain period of time. Now, when you look at the steps with Ju which uh, Judas took, you can see several of them. First of all, he lacked saving faith. The Bible says in John chapter 6 and verse 64, but there are some among you who don't believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning those who would not believe and the one who would betray him. All right, so that was John 6, 64. The Greek words which indicate that the betrayer is going to come out of the unbelieving. And, uh, and, and so Judas never really bought into the idea that Jesus is Savior or the Messiah. But there is another serious issue going on here. Judas has very little personal relationship uh, uh, with Jesus. Every time in Scripture where we see Judas addressing Jesus, he never called Jesus Lord. He would always refer to him as master or teacher or rabbi. And so Judas is not buying into the messiahship of Jesus. And he certainly is not buying the Lord into the lordship. Thirdly, he did. Uh, he had a disrespect for Jesus because he's bargaining for goodness sakes. Think about this. You're bargaining over the life of an innocent man. You're selling out an innocent man. Ask yourself how much money would you need in order to betray or to sell out an innocent man? Think about it. How much money would I need to offer you to set up an innocent man so that he could die a horrible death, uh, such as a crucifixion? This guy, Judas, says, give me 30 pieces of silver. Now in that culture, uh, one piece of silver was worth four denarii. 
uh, and so you're talking about 120 denarii, that's about 15 to 20 thousand dollars in today's money standards. So it was a pretty in, a decent amount of money that he would be awarded. Um, um, it's the same amount of money uh, that would be awarded by the courts if you're if you lost a slave who was gored by an ox. You read in Exodus chapter 21 and verse 32, if an ox gores a male or female slave, he must give 30 shekels of silver to the slave's master and the ox must be stoned. And so is it not interesting that Judas bargains for the same amount as a gored slave or a gored servant? Now, when Jesus is on the cross, he is a servant of the Lord doing the will of the Father. And what do we do? We gore him, we pierce him with nails in his wrists and his ankles, and then we spear his side. It's obvious that Judas does not comprehend the value of his target, Jesus Christ, and so he simply is settling for 30 pieces of silver. Fourthly, uh, Judas was consumed with greed because in John chapter 12, the Bible tells us in verse 6, John 12, 6 says, Judas did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to take from what was put in uh, into it. So this is the difference between devotion and betrayal. So ask yourselves, are you devoted to God? Or is there potential that you might betray God? What is the difference? Devotion means that you're going to give the best that you have if you're not giving the best that you have to your marriage or to your friendships or to your family or to God, then you're not devoted to those relationships. Make sure that you are not just a devoted church attender, but rather you're devoted to the relationship you have with Jesus Christ. What, ha what about betrayal? Notice the first recorded words out of Judas's mouth. What will you give me? That is betrayal. That is where you take narcissistic behavior into your relationship. If a marriage is about you, if your friendship, your friendships are about you, if your relationship with Jesus is about you, it is only a matter of time that you will be betraying that relationship. Ask yourself, is your relationship with God all about healing you, helping you, doing for you? Then it is only a matter of time before you will be betraying the Lord Jesus Christ. Betrayal is the fruit of self-centered behavior, and that type of behavior will result in betrayal. And if that is a concern for you, pray to God that he will give you a heart for devotion in all of your relationships. The devil does not want to destroy you today. He wants to destroy you at the end. And the way that he does that over a long period of time is to bring you back to our human natures of self-centeredness. And if you don't manage that moment by moment and day by day, you're going to surrender to the enemy and the result will be the betrayal of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christianity is the exact opposite of human nature. The devil supports human nature, that's self-centeredness. The opposite of self-centeredness is Christianity. Love God with all your heart. That's Deuteronomy 6.5. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's Leviticus 19.18. What is it going to be? Self-centered behavior for you, which leads to betrayal? Or is it going to be unconditional love for you, which leads you to the devotion to Jesus Christ? Keep praying for the Holy Spirit to give you a heart of unconditional love and devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, I hope this has been helpful and informative. Our next study will continue in Matthew chapter 26, verses 17 to 30. Thank you for viewing and good day.